And good afternoon. Once again, we welcome back guests and members joining us for worship here in Grimsby and also watching via the live stream. We have one announcement or reminder. It's more an announcement. There is a coffee social downstairs after the service in light of the baptism that we're having this afternoon. And we welcome to the pulpit our own Pastor Rolf, who will lead us in worship. Good afternoon. Out of reverence for the Lord, let's begin together this afternoon while standing. These are the opening words of Psalm 113 as our call to worship this afternoon. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. We respond to this call to worship in unison with the confession that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also our Lord's greeting, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's also join a psalm of response to this greeting of our God will sing the words of Psalm 81, the stanzas 1, 2, 4, and 5. Let's then also read together from the book of Psalms, Psalm 51, which I'd like to read in connection with Lord's Day 26. That's where we've come as we, in living light, have been uh, going through the Heidelberg Catechism, studying the doctrine of salvation, summarized there Sunday by Sunday. Lord's Day 26 is about baptism. Lord's Day 27 also, uh, but focuses then on infant baptism this morning, this afternoon, uh, in some ways, baptism more generally. Lord's Day 26 pairs well with Psalm 51 as David 
confesses his sin and then looks to God to be the one who might wash him from that sin as baptism confirms for us. So let's read Psalm 51 together. It is to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So far... The Selective Scripture reading. In response, we'll also sing together from Psalm 69. You may notice as we sing Psalm 69, for those of you that are familiar with the Book of Praise, that it has the same melody as Psalm 51 in the Book of Praise. Psalm 51 and 69, the same melody, because in many ways they also communicate similar truths, and so it's fitting to put it to the same melody. Psalm 69 is a psalm that very clearly foreshadows the coming of Christ as the one in whom we have this washing away of our sins. So fitting for us also to sing Psalm 69 in connection with baptism and with the preaching of God's Word. Let's sing Psalm 69, the stanzas 1, 6, and 10.
As I said here in Living Light, we've come to Lord's Day 26 as we study God's Word, confessed and summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 26. It is our custom here that I read the question and invite you to join together in reciting the answer as they appear on the screen. How does holy baptism signify and seal to you that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross benefits you? In this way, Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul, that is, all my sins. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? To be washed with Christ's blood means to receive forgiveness of sins from God through grace because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. Where has Christ promised that he will wash us with his blood and spirit? as surely as we are washed with the water of baptism. In the institution of baptism, where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This promise is repeated where Scripture calls baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. As our amen to the message, we'll sing together the words of Psalm 101, the stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the message on Lord's Day 25, which we had here two weeks ago, had as its title, In Christ Alone. We sang that hymn together, our entire salvation, we confess, there rests on Christ's one sacrifice on the cross. That's taught in the preaching we heard. It is also assured in the sacraments. Our entire salvation is in Christ alone. That's not just our salvation as opposed to someone else's salvation. Our salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice on the cross, whereas for the Buddhist it is the eightfold pathway. Well, they might think that's salvation, but it's not. True salvation for anyone, we confessed last time, is through Christ's one sacrifice on the cross. After all, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Paul repeats in Acts 4 verse 24, there is no other name under heaven given to, my met, given to men by whom we can be saved. No other name given to men. Now, none of that fits very well with our supposedly tolerant culture. In a society that says, go ahead and believe what you want to believe, if that's what works for you, then go ahead and believe that. It just doesn't work for me. We have to confess wholeheartedly in response, but there is no other way. There is no other way. And we know that to be true both from the Word and the sacraments. The only ground for our salvation is in the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Without Him, we have nothing. Nothing. That is very exclusive. But it is the truth revealed in the Word of God. Now then objections are sometimes raised. What about those who have never heard about Christ? Can there really be no hope for their salvation? You know, those tribes who have perhaps for centuries lived in the wilderness or the jungle where missionaries have never reached as the question often goes. Or perhaps those who were simply missed by the gospel in history. They've never known anything about the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
What about them? Now, we don't have to pry into the righteous judgments of God. Instead, we marvel at His good pleasure. This is what we confess in the Kenneth Adore, chapter 3, 4, article 7. I quote, the cause of this very distribution of the gospel, speaking about the gospel going to some and, and not to, to others, the cause of this very distribution of the gospel is not to be ascribed to the worthiness of one people over another, nor to the better use of the light of nature, but to the sovereign good pleasure and undeserved love of God, end of quote. And what does the canon say our reaction to that should be? I quote, therefore, we to whom so great a, a grace is granted beyond and contrary to all that we deserve ought to acknowledge it with a humble and grateful heart, end of quote. In other words, don't question God's fairness on why some don't know Christ. Instead, praise Him for His unfairness, as it were, in giving you grace. A grace that we have preached to us this afternoon and confirmed in baptism. Baptism says, too, very clearly that I am washed in Christ alone. That's the message this afternoon. Baptism says, I'm washed in Christ alone. And first, we hear about why I need it. Secondly, how I get it. And third, where I see it. Baptism says I'm washed in Christ alone. First of all, why I need it, this washing. Each of the bedrooms in our house at home has a laundry basket. Maybe many of your homes have the same. Periodically, almost daily it seems sometimes, those baskets get carried from the bedroom to the laundry room. As I'm working downstairs, I hear this upstairs. And occasionally I hear the question, why is this in the laundry? Well, maybe it's because our youngest threw something in there that wasn't supposed to be in there. But more often than not, it's a question about clean clothes. Why is this in the laundry? Did you even wear this? Apparently, it's easier to just throw it in the basket than to put it in the cupboard or the drawer. And I doubt that it's just our house. I know it's not just our house. But it is a fair question, isn't it? Why is this in the laundry? You don't put it in there unless it needs washing because it's dirty. You don't typically wash what's clean. So when the Bible talks about washing, we get that. Probably most of the boys and girls here this afternoon get that too. You wash something when it's dirty. Sometimes you don't see it right away, how dirty it is or how dirty you are. A hot, humid day might leave you sweaty and sticky, but you don't always see that right away. Some filth is invisible. But you wash anyway when you know that it's dirty. You've got to love the sacraments. They are so special in their simplicity. We hear the word baptize. And we probably think of, the, of this commandment, first of the, the sacrament. But the word baptize wasn't always as technical a word, if we could put it that way, as it is today. In Jesus' day, they might have first related the word for baptizing to a similar sounding word, which is the word for dipping, bapto. Think of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man asked Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger, to, to bapto his finger in water and cool his tongue because of its agony. Or Judas dips his bread in the wine with Jesus. Baptize sounds like bapto, which is simply dipping. Even the word to baptize, as Jesus uses it, is a Greek word, baptizo. Sounds the same almost. It's used in the Old Testament translation when they translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. They use that baptizo for cleansing and for purification, which you know about in the Old Testament, purification laws. Think of the story of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Elisha tells Naaman to go and wash himself in the Jordan River seven times. 
wash yourself is the command. So what does Naaman do? We're told in verse 15 that he eventually dips himself in the river. He baptizes himself in the river. Picture Jesus then about to ascend into heaven, giving his great commission, which we read together in Lord's Day 26, question answer 71. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the Jewish ears of his disciples, Jesus' choice of words comes with all kinds of background for them. Background of purification rituals. Background of these washing ceremonies. Go and make disciples of all nations, washing them and cleansing them. And the simple message to them is, they're dirty. Baptism says we are washed in Christ alone. Why do we need it? Very simply, because we're dirty. Jesus wouldn't have commanded baptism if we were clean. And so the form we're going to read later for Samantha's baptism also explains this way, the immersion in or sprinkling with water signifies the impurity of our souls. And that captures the wording of our Lord's Day this afternoon as well. His blood and spirit wash away the impurity of our soul that is all my sins. Baptism says very simply and very clearly, you need washing because your sin makes you dirty. We have to think on that and reflect on that. When we later see the hiring stand up here at this baptismal font and witness the water sprinkled on Samantha's head, even she needs washing because she's dirty, like me, like you. But that's not always so easy to admit, is it? We read the beautiful Psalm 51. David's very frank and honest confession of sin after committing adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, he begins, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in iniquity did my mother conceive me. It's moving, Psalm, isn't it? Moving in its rawness, in its brokenness. As David will sing later in the same psalm, the sacrifices of God are a, a broken and contrite spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And you can hear that when you read the psalm. The words that we can take up as our own. A heartfelt confession of sin. But there's a backstory to that psalm, isn't there? It's the story of Nathan in 2 Samuel 12 when Nathan the prophet pays David a visit. Then Nathan tells David, perhaps you remember, about a rich man with many sheep and a poor man with one sheep, one that he treats as a daughter, and how that rich man, when he received a guest, a traveling guest, took the lamb from the one man and, and offered it as a meal for his guest. And as David hears this story, he becomes very angry. He says, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And so he convicts himself with his own words. That was Nathan's point. David was that rich man who had everything. And yet David coveted, committed adultery, murdered, deceived, and tried to cover it all up as if it can be hidden from the eyes of God. Very likely, Psalm 32 was written about the same. For when I kept silent, David sings there, he was silent. See, Psalm 51 didn't just flow from his lips or from his pen or however. He put the psalm together the day after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Maybe not even days later. Maybe it was a year later. Hide it, deny it, downplay it. That's what we do with sin. 
Because sometimes we are unconsciously blind to our own sin or we are consciously blind to our own sin. And maybe David would have tried to leave it all right there and just take it with him to the grave. But God wouldn't let him. He sent Nathan to expose him. But because he couldn't and he wouldn't, admit his own sin of his own. There are times that we need a Nathan to come along and point out our sin for us, to confront us with our sin. Or if not a Nathan, the sacrament of baptism. Baptism for Samantha this afternoon isn't only about God's grace to her. God gives it as a gift to his church. We get to benefit from her baptism too. The sprinkling with water later signifies the impurity of our souls too. Why else would this washing in Christ be necessary? That gives us an opportunity to come clean before God. The call of the gospel always is repent and believe. Baptism says to all of us this afternoon, you need to be washed. You need to be washed in Christ. So come clean, beloved. We're going to hear it in the forum later too, what David sings. By nature we are children of wrath. We are conceived and born in sin. How does that show itself in your life? Every circumstance in our life, every situation, whether it's a good situation or a bad situation, whether it's easy or whether it's difficult, every one of them presents us with a test, as it were. How are you going to respond in this situation? With what words, with what actions, with what thoughts? Where is all that coming from? Doesn't it all come from what's deep down in the heart? That's what Jesus teaches. Out of the overflow of the heart. Or from the heart comes. In the course, How People Change, which we're going to be able to participate in soon, hopefully, as congregation, they use this great illustration, which has probably stuck with all of us who have been busy with it already. It's an illustration of a glass of water, glass of water. If I have a glass of water and I bump it, what will happen? If there's enough water in it, water will come out. Then if I ask, why does the water come out? Think on what your response to that would be. Why does water come out if I bump the glass? It's tempting to say because you bumped the glass. But that's not accurate, is it? Not entirely. Water comes out because water was in it. If I bump the glass, milk won't come out of it because there's no milk in it. There's water in it. Water comes out when it's bumped because water was in it. Similarly, our lives. It's tempting to blame our situations, our circumstances that bump us in life for the sin that comes out. But that's not it. Sin comes out because sin is in the heart. My heart. Those sinful words, those sinful actions, those sinful thoughts, they come from a heart that is by nature sinful. The more you consider that, the more you meditate on that, the more you realize how all-pervasive the impact of sin is. Sin is still very present even in the life of a child of God. Now, I don't say all of that this afternoon, beloved, to discourage you and to bear you down. To beat you down, it's to face reality. But a reality in light of the sacrament. God is telling us about his grace. As though he says, I see that you need washing desperately. Be washed in Christ alone. Don't try to hide your sin. Don't think that you can scrub yourself clean of your sin. Here is a washing that you need and that I am offering to you in the blood of Christ. 
Yes, baptism says that to me too, how I get this washing. Our second point. For answer 69 says, Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my souls that is my soul that is all my sins. That word promise, with it gave the promise. That's a key word. He gave the promise. That's followed up again in question and answer 71. Where has Christ promised? And then a few different Bible texts are woven together and it comes to the end. This promise is repeated. Lord's Day 27 continues. It's expanding on it. And again, we come across it in question and answer 74. The Holy Spirit who works faith are promised to them. Promise, promise, promise. The promise. Baptism itself doesn't wash away sins. It by itself doesn't accomplish the salvation from sin. It's about a promise. It's not even going to be a sign of of some kind of faith that already exists necessarily in Samantha. It's about the promise. And this is, again, the promise which we confessed. As surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul that is all my sins. That's a very clear and powerful promise. Again, don't you just love the sacraments? Also as parents, it's true for all of us. Not just, it's true for all of us, but baptism, for, for example, is so clear, it's so simple, it's so explainable, even to our youngest children. A great teachable moment in the pew. Baptism gives us the gospel promise so very clearly. It's a very clear picture that baptism presents. And with that clear picture, a very clear promise. As surely as water washes away dirt from the body, as surely as water, summer is upon us. Hours of playing in the sun, in the sandbox, at the beach, who knows where. The youngest kids here this afternoon know how that goes too. Sometimes when you empty the bathtub at the end of the day, you're done that bath, the water is drained out, there's a layer of sand in there. Water and soap washes that off the body. As surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul that is all my sins. So certainly. That's what Christ's blood and spirit does. Wash away all my sins. That's the promise. As was mentioned, Lord's Day 27 will go on to say that the water itself doesn't wash away sins, only Christ's blood and spirit. It's not as though once washed with water at baptism that sin is automatically gone. The promise of your baptism still demands a response to that baptism. That's why Jordan and Jennifer are going to hear it later too. A reminder for all who have been blessed with children. Parents have the duty to instruct their children in these things. We want our children to grab hold of those promises by faith. We all need to grab hold of those promises by faith. And how do you do that? What does that look like? It looks like what we read in Psalm 51. When we turn to God with humble hearts, contrite hearts, confessing our sin and repenting from them. It looks like the realization that no matter how much we might try to scrub ourselves clean, the only effective washing is the blood and spirit of Christ. David says it. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and I shall be whiter than snow. That's his plea. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, sorry. Or he says to hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Blot out. You blot out something that's been written down. That's what the image is. David has in mind that there exists this record of his sins that's written down, all of his sins. Blot it out, Lord. He says, destroy that record. Baptism doesn't only say that we need the washing, but also how we get it. Only when that record of sins has been blotted out and dealt with. David didn't know how all that was going to unfold because it's not until the New Testament that we realize what it was going to take. Paul uses the same language as David does in Colossians 2 verse 13 and 14 when he says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of our debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Imagine that. That there was this record of your debt, a book or perhaps just a long, long, long sheet of paper detailing everything that you have ever said that was sinful, thought, done, whatever. And that that was nailed to the cross. Little did David know that's how his pleas would be answered. But he was sure that they would be answered. His plea in Psalm 51 comes with confidence and assurance. Verse 7. It's as though David is looking very directly at God when he says, Purge me with his... You, God, purge me with his... And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. If God purges us, if God washes us, then and only then will we be clean. Whiter than snow in Christ alone. And baptism is going to say to us again this afternoon, as the gospel message from God, I promise you that I will do that. In Christ's blood and spirit, I will wash you. It's my promise to you. Just turn to me and live. Turn to me and live a changed life. That's where we also see the washing in Christ alone. Where do I get to see it? To be washed with his blood and spirit, we confessed, means to receive forgiveness of sins from God. To be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ. So that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. More and more we become dead to sin. More and more, that's language of growth, isn't it? We could say that if being baptized into Christ's blood in a way makes us look backward, washed of the sins we have committed, being baptized with Christ's spirit makes us look forward at an increasingly changed life. One commentator puts it this way. I quote, baptism reminds me of what has happened already and encourages me to become what by faith in Christ I am, holy and blameless before God. For as you can read in Romans chapter 6, being baptized isn't only the promise of being united with Christ in his death. It's also his resurrection. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism, Paul says, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And later, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that life in Christ grows. Here's how it's described in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 and 18. I quote, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. That's the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. 
For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. What's Paul saying? We are being transformed into that image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. That's the promise of baptism. When we are baptized into the Spirit of Christ, that there would be this growth into glory, that we would more and more become what we are in Christ, holy and blameless before God, that you would be transformed again into that image of Jesus. Even David, in Psalm 51, well before Christ came, he understood that connection between washing and the work of the Spirit. Purge me with hyssop, he sings, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And what's going to come out of that? What is all of that going to look like? What are people going to see? Well, David says, if you do all of this, Verse 13, then I will teach, your trans teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Washed clean, filled with the Spirit, then teaching transgressors your ways. Forgiven sinners become teachers. I said it already this morning, the school year is officially over. But as we heard this morning too, we're never done teaching. None of us. This morning it was about teaching the next generation, but here we have to say that even the next generation should be teaching. The moment that any of us understands and grasps the wonder of God's forgiveness in Christ, we become teachers. Then you can't say, like I hear people say sometimes, I could never be a teacher. You have to be. You want to be. Baptism says you are washed in Christ alone, and that's where you're going to see it. In your desire to teach others about the forgiving grace of God in Jesus Christ. To teach it in your words and in your actions. There will be this evidence of the washing with the Spirit of Christ. I will see it. The catechism summarizes it. We become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. Holy. The students that I have in my catechism classes, they're always quick to define that as holy means set apart. It's a good way to put it. We lead a set apart life. It looks different from our world. It looks different from our culture. It has different priorities, different pursuits, different goals. It has a different mindset towards our entertainment. It has a, a different ear for music. It has a different eye for movies. It has a different taste for drinking. It draws out the reaction from people who see us. There's something different about you. Holy. Different. And blameless. Blameless, says the catechism. That's not perfect. Otherwise, Job and Zechariah and Elizabeth and many others in the Bible, they couldn't be identified as blameless. They weren't perfect. But blameless means having a one heart focus on living for Jesus Christ. An undivided aim to live according to the commandments of God. A pure desire to acknowledge Him in everything. There's an integrity there, in other words, an honesty, a transparency. It's in knowing that we depend on Christ alone. It's a living a life that has the cross of Jesus Christ as its focus. It's what the cadets sing as their theme song. Right, cadets, this afternoon? Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. And what's that going to look like? We could say it starts 
with joy. David sings in his brokenness, restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, sin and all of its consequences in this world can be so joy-sucking, so joy-depleting. But to have our hearts focused again on our washing in Christ alone, as baptism also says it, that is joy-producing. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. What joy that salvation brings to know ourselves washed in Christ alone. A joy that ought to radiate from us so that, as Paul and James also say in the New Testament, we can even rejoice in our suffering, in our trials. Because if baptism says that I am washed in Christ alone, then having been washed, I can also be presented in glory on the day of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more joyful than that. Amen. These are words of Jesus as he sends out his apostles into the world in Matthew chapter 10 already when he says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, or it could also be translated as the word confesses me, so everyone who confesses me before men, I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. May we, by God's grace, be found among those who are freely confessing him before men. Let's do that here as well, confessing together with the church of all times and all places the words of the Apostles' Creed. Put the words of the Apostles' Creed. We'll recite that together. We are joining the Catholic Church of Christ with these words. Let everyone say together with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. There he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We now have the privilege of witnessing the administration of baptism for Samantha Marlene Harink. Before we witness that together, let's first consider further what God's Word teaches us about baptism and specifically about the baptism of infants as that's been explained and summarized in the form which we have adopted for that purpose. It can be found in the back of the Book of Praise, page 597, if you would like to read along. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of holy baptism is summarized as follows. First, we and our children are conceived and born in sin and are therefore by nature children of wrath so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. This is what the immersion in or sprinkling with water teaches us. It signifies the impurity of our souls so that we may detest ourselves, humble ourselves before God, and seek our cleansing and salvation outside of ourselves. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. We are therefore baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that He establishes an eternal covenant of grace with us. He adopts us for His children and heirs and promises to provide us with all good and avert all evil or turn it to our benefit. When we are baptized into the name of the Son, God the Son promises us that He washes us in His blood from all our sins and unites us with Him in His death and resurrection. Thus, we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this sacrament that He will dwell in us and make us living members of Christ, imparting to us what we have in Christ, namely the cleansing from our sins and the daily renewal of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without blemish among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. Third, Since every covenant contains two parts, a promise and an obligation, we are, through baptism, called and obliged by the Lord to a new obedience. We are to cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to trust Him and to love Him with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and with all our strength. We must not love the world, but put off our old nature and lead a God-fearing life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sins, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin. For baptism is a seal and trustworthy testimony that we have an eternal covenant with God. Although our children do not understand all this, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism. Just as they share without their knowledge in the condemnation of Adam, so are they without their knowledge received into grace in Christ. For the Lord spoke to Abraham, the father of all believers, and thus also speaks to us and our children, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Peter also testifies to this when he says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Therefore, in the old dispensation, God commanded that infants be circumcised. This circumcision was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. Christ also took them in His arms and blessed them, laying His hands on them. In the new dispensation, baptism has replaced circumcision. Therefore, infants must be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of His covenant. And as they grow up, their parents have the duty to instruct them in these things. In order that we may now administer this holy sacrament of God to His glory for our comfort and to the upbuilding of the congregation, let's call upon His holy name. O 
Almighty, eternal God, in Your righteous judgment, You punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood. But in Your great mercy, saved and protected the believer Noah and his family. You drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, but led Your people Israel through the midst of the sea on dry ground, by which baptism was signified. We therefore pray that You, in Your infinite mercy, will graciously look upon this, your child, and incorporate Samantha by your Holy Spirit into your Son, Jesus Christ, so that she may be buried with Him by baptism into death and raised with Him to walk in newness of life. We pray that she, following Him day by day, may joyfully bear her cross and cleave to Him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Grant that she, comforted in you, may leave this life which is no more than a constant death, and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ, your Son. All this we ask through Him, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. I ask you to join me up here. Beloved in Christ the Lord, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord our God to seal to us and our children His covenant. We must therefore use this sacrament for that purpose and not out of custom or superstition. That it may be clear then that you desire baptism for the right purpose, you are to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you confess that our children... Though conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation, are sanctified in Christ or set apart in Christ and thus as members of His church ought to be baptized? Second, do you confess that the doctrine of the Old and New Testament summarized in the confessions and taught here in this Christian church is the true and complete doctrine of salvation? Third, do you promise as Father and as mother, to instruct your child in this doctrine as soon as she is able to understand and to have her instructed therein to the utmost of your power. What is your answer, Brother Haring and Sister Haring? After the administration of baptism, let's stand together with them and sing God's glory and His praise with hymn seven, stanza two. Samantha Marlene Haring. I baptize you into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive also his triune greeting and go your ways in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.